Uh, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our speaker is Greg Forrester. Many of you, of course, know him, so I, I'm not going to give you a long introduction. So we know about his career and, and we know how he came to Carolina, but what I really would like to point out you know, from my own observations, because I know him for a very long time like from my grad school, uh, what I would really like to say that somehow you know, he always works on hard, interesting problems. Uh, yeah, from his thesis, uh, following on you know, polymers and what he's doing now is just all really exciting and interesting. So Greg, tell us more about that. Okay, thank you all so much for inviting me. Notice I work on that. I have way more problems than I have solutions. Um, so it's great to be here. Sorry, we can't meet more regularly, but apparently that will be put off for at least another semester. Um, so I'm going to tell you about something you may have heard about. Um, SARS-CoV-2 respiratory infections. I'm going to talk mainly about what goes on in our lungs, not transmission. Um, the folks that I am, the PIs I work with are Ronnie Freeman, who's a third year in applied physical sciences, sciences who does a lot of work on the chemical structure of everything from the virus to mucus. And Sam Lai, um, who I've been working with for a long time, I'll tell you about the work we've been doing, um, mainly on trying to understand how antibodies protect you. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the team. Um, Alex Chen was a student of Andrea Bertozzi that came as a sanity postdoc and worked with me for four years. Um, Working, the very first person who started working with me on how antibodies really protect you on the mucosal barriers on every organ in your body. Tim Wessler, who was sent to me by Mansoor and, and you, um, who was my PhD student. He went to, to Michigan to work with, um, you, let's see, I can't remember the name, but um, he's now back as a postdoc and looking for a job settling between industry and academics. Jason Pearson, who's a PhD student with me and Boyce, uh, just got into this project two months ago, and I'll show you some of his work. And Kate Deftari, who works with me and Katie Newman. So the people who, are, who really know what's going on medically and virally are my collaborators, Rick Richet, who I've been working with for 23 years now. He's the director of the Moscow Lung Institute. And then Ray Pickles, who's a virus expert. Um, and then I want to just give a shout out to the working groups that have been spawned post-COVID, led by Reinhard Lavenbacher and James Glaser. And I've built many collaborations with me weekly for over a year now. And it's open working groups, so anyone can join us. So um, I'm from the South, I like to tell a story. Um, I didn't just walk into COVID. Um, two years after I got to UNC, I was approached by the Moscow Lung Institute to study lung mechanics, and they were very interested in um, cystic fibrosis, especially, but also other pathologies. And so we've been working with them for 23 years. Then 10 years ago, Sam Lai came from Hopkins and was showing us pretty amazing um, results on antibodies protecting um, HIV AIDS people in a Thailand clinical trial. And since then, I've built a group around Sam Lai's work on how antibodies really protect you, either from vaccinations or infection or engineered antibodies. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But then comes this animal, um, and we have no protection. So I had been studying how antibodies and other immune responses protect you, but now you have no protection. And what, if you look around all the literature, the score, I mean, uncountable 
papers. Um, there's all kinds of stuff coming out daily among, among multiple listservs that keep sending me papers and I get tons of them daily now. Um, but now what we wanted to do was to back up and talk about what happens before your immune system or, or a vaccine or a drug kicks in to explain what was happening in the early days of this pandemic. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about once we actually now have interventions for this virus, how do we model that and how does that always looking for can we understand what's happening clinically and observationally so the baseline is going to be pre-immune protection um since i've been working on one for 23 years i have a lot of intel that you're going to have a hell of a time for. Um, we know a lot about the geometry and dimensions of the entire respiratory tract we know what liquids are in there. We know how thick they are. We know how long the generations are. Um, we know how, which many people do not pay attention to, how the mucus layer is being transported by coordinated cilia everywhere in the respiratory tract. So everything is scaling as you go all the way down from the upper respiratory tract, the trachea, all the way to the deep lung. Everything is scaling with the geometry that it has to get to the to where you do oxygen exchange. Because of the folks I work with in, in medicine, we also know a lot about SARS CoV 2. We know it's hydrodynamic radius, so how it diffuses. We know what cells are infectable. We know with what probability they're likely to be infected, which has a lot to do with ACE2 receptor density to the spikes. We know how much they replicate and for how long they replicate. So we're going to use all of that information in the model. And then we're going to simulate outcomes. For you, you inhale. The first time you get exposed, you inhale. And so it lands somewhere in the respiratory tract. And the question is, OK, now what happens? So given all of the anatomy, physiology, and infectability, and motility of those viruses, we're going to simulate what happens wherever it lands. Um, and we're focusing on what we observed early on, which is, you may not know this, but this is about the clinical data. You get a mild exposure to SARS-CoV-2, you're going to get a nasal infection. If you get a nasal infection, then you have a very low probability, but not too low, of three to five percent that it's going to transport to your deep lungs. That's the clinical data. Okay. So, um, can we understand that and, and replicate it? And then I'm going to talk about what's happened now that we've had interventions. Mutations. We know very little about those mutations. We know a lot chemically about what domains are, are mutating and where the mutations are happening. Um, and that they amplify the heck out of infections. We're going to try to see if we can understand what's actually happening that amplifies infections. And then I'll talk about antibiotic protection, which we've only been looking at for the last month. Okay, so I call this the global to local landscape. If you start with the branching structure of the lung, I'm idealizing the, the cylindrical airways, but the cylindrical airways, if you look at them, you have the epithelial surface. Next, you have the paraciliary liquid where the cilia be. That's always seven microns thick. The cilia are eight microns long. So on the power stroke, they touch mucus. Then you have a mucus layer and then you have the air core. I'll show you the dimensions as you go down into the deep lung in a minute. Um, and the mucus is being infected from the nose down to be swallowed, from the lower lung up to be swallowed. Preset by the flow of amniotic fluid in the womb. 
the power stroke. How does it know to go one way and not the and not the other? And then we know everything about from the nasal passage all the way to the alveolar space. What percentage of the cells are infectable and how infectable are they? Okay, so like data, this is physiological data. Okay, you start from the trachea and go all the way to the alveolar stacks. And there are, depending in the literature, you can just get bounds on this. How long are the generations? What's their diameter? How thick is mucus? How fast is mucus being transported by coordinated cilia? And that velocity you can see goes all the way down to where it's stagnant by the time you get to the big one. So it doesn't look like a lot, millimeters per minute is what I'm showing there. But as you go down, the mucus becomes stagnant. So it, and it, you can imagine that um, it can't be moving a whole lot if you're going down in the deep lung, right? It's a branching structure that just keeps branching, branching, branching. So it has to slow down by the time you get to the deep lung. Here's what we know about the alpha variant. Um, we know what its diffusivity is in buffer or mucus. We know what cells in the deep lung are infectable and what surface area they constitute. In the upper respiratory tract, it's almost all of ciliated cells. There are some secretory cells that are infectable, but it's more or less the ciliated cells. Um, and then once a cell gets, if you have an encounter, a cell gets infected, it's about 12 hours of a eclipse phase before it hijacks the machinery, then starts replicating, believe it or not, 50,000 copies of itself a day. And fortunately, only 2,000 of them are infectable. So it's doing inefficient copying of itself, 4% efficiency with the alpha variant. And so that's the data we use. Um, and I'll show you the model in a second. So here is the only math slide. Um, like I say, this is not complicated. Um, we know what the geometry is. We know what the diffusivity is. We know what mucus is being infected by cilia as you go from the nose to the trachea all the way to the deep lung. So it's an infection diffusion problem in a cylindrical geometry. Um, and then we know. Um, I'll show you in a minute. We know the infectability per encounter per second of a SARS CoV 2 virion with an infectable cell. It's a non infectable cell. Also. Um, so, what I want to compute is let's imagine that you inhale an, an aerosol, say, and it lands somewhere. Anyway, let's compute the outcome. Okay. Does it get, by the way, I may have said somewhere, but mucociliary clearance is your only protection. We were designed to trap everything that comes in with air in order to do oxygen exchange and it lands on what my friend Richard Shea calls nature's fly paper. Your lung is full of mucus, stuff that hits it gets stuck and then it gets transported. Viruses and other things are going to just normally diffuse. And the big game for you is can you clear it before it, it passes through the mucosal barrier and PCL you know, and comes to cell and infects? So we're going to compute the probability of infection within each generation. That depends on where you land. I'm computing probability of will infect in the generation you land. If you land at the, at the upstream end where mucus is carrying you into that generation or in the middle, I can give it to you everywhere else, but I'll give you those two. Then once we know that, if you have an inhaled load, I can tell you the probability, what number of them, let's say you inhaled 100 aerosols while you're having a 
conversation in a bar or in a restaurant or just standing around and doing. I'll tell you how many of you can just convolve this information and compute the probability that you'll get an infection before it gets there. Depending on what the load is, how many infectious carry on, and where they land, they're either going to get transported and get swallowed, or some of them are going to infect. It's a calculation. Then, knowing that though, now I can pass to a very much simpler initial condition, which is now I have an infected cell somewhere that happened given the load and where it landed. Okay, there's an infected cell somewhere, pick it in the lung, in the respiratory tract. Um, it's going to go through for the alpha bearing and 12 hour eclipse phase once it infects. And now it's going to start reproducing 2,000 infectious virions a day for three days. And then it explodes. Okay, now what? What happens to that infected from that every one of those infected cells anywhere in the respiratory? Here's the data. Probability of infection if you start in the nasal passages at the top before it's going down the entire nasal passage. Damn hot, 90% or 91%. Um, if it landed in the middle, so it only had to go halfway before it goes to the oropharyngeal tract, 68 or 69% probability that it will infect before it clears. So one minus that for the things that got clear to the next generation. And then as you go down, the probability of infection because of both the thickness of the fluid, the length of the generation, then and the infection velocity, those together determine probability of infection. We run, I forget, maybe Alex Chen needs to do these simulations, maybe we did 10,000 to get good statistics. As you go down, Notice that you get weird results here relative to in the middle. And the reason is that um, once infection gets weak, diffusion is competing with infection, and so it could have gone in the previous generation. So it's a misleading statistic there. You're going to infect, it's just that it's, it's not necessarily within that generation. So if you start in the middle, you're going to infect before you get out of there. Okay, so that data we now stick that in our pocket, and now we say, okay, now I'm going to talk about you had an infection somewhere. What happens? Here's what happens the action. One simulation, we can do a lot more if we want, it's going to be hard to show the pictures. Um, in the nasal passage, you're traveling down. In the trachea, and then generations 5, 10, 15, you're going up. So we're talking about an infection that started in the, in the upstream end of that generation. And then how does it propagate over 12, 24, 36 hours? After the cell was infected and started replicating. Okay, so we removed the infection happened, an eclipse phase happened, now it starts producing infectious virions 2,000 a day for three days. So it's already been producing 1,000 infectious virions. And what you notice is that infection is creating streaks of infection. Infection is creating streaks of infection. Every infection, because infection is so dominant in these generations, is following the infection velocity of that generation. By the time you get to the lower generations where infection is weak, then it's stalled. And mucus is thinner there. And what's happening is, is that it's infecting, it's, it's infecting sooner. So mucociliary clearance was designed to protect you 
But in fact, when you don't have any antibodies in that mucus, it's, it's the opposite. It's literally exploding the infection because it's not being infected. So it's transporting stuff, but there's still a lot of encounters with infection itself. Um, and all of these scales, you'll notice that <clears throat> the streak, when I say a streak, you you can you will transport throughout the entire generation and not even coming close to going all around the circumference. So the infection is literally in the cylinder, staying along in one little streak of the cylinder. And the bottom line here is even when you get down low here, the infection is going up with the facility clearance. Here, it's going down toward the, toward the esophagus to be swallowed with mucociliary clearance. Once mucociliary clearance gets real weak, the thicknesses are so thin that it's also not going anywhere. So it's never making progress toward the deep lung. That seems like a trivial result. It's a profound result. It says that you're not getting infected in the deep lung by progression of infection and viruses diffusing from anywhere up above. So that was about infectious cells. This is about the viral load. So you can now ask, well, what happens to the viruses? Well, they're being shed like crazy. The first cell was shedding 2,000 a day for three days. Another cell gets infected, I showed you. These are the number of infected cells, depending on what generation you have. Ballistic numbers, not infected cells. These are infectious virions being replicated. And by the way, the, the spread of infection is not cell to cell. That's way more inefficient than you shed the infected cell, sheds the virions back into the mucus, mucus in the, and paraciliary liquid, and then it spreads rapidly through that mechanism, not through cell to cell. So just look at the numbers. After one and a half days, from one infected cell that just came out of the eclipse phase, you've got 10 to the 8 infectious shed virion. This is why people are telling me, don't, don't get exposed, okay? One cell does this. Um, a bunch of them would have cleared the generations because of clearance, clearance but not going away, depending on where it was going in the next generation. This many remain free in the airway surface liquid, and the rest are all in cells. Um, and then it's just also not just like the, the infection wasn't spreading in the deep lung, getting toward the deep lung in generations 10 and 15, neither are the virions going anywhere. Um, and none of them have cleared in 36 hours. So things aren't moving as you go deeper into the lung, either the infection. The infection is not moving toward anywhere, and neither are the infected, the viral load moving anywhere. Um, so the, the bottom line here is, get one to 200 of these events happening in the nasal passage, you got a significant high tide initial effect. And there's a whole lot of data out there that support that that's clinically what's happening. And this shows you absolutely it's happening. Okay, so don't get exposed. That's why you, you should wear a mask. Everyone should wear a mask when you're not protected. Um, and then this is the bottom line is there's no way that there's any um, spread from the upper areas of the lung to the deep lung. Yeah. So, it's like definitely the infection and to your own I'm sorry, I can't. 
I can't hear you. I will come back to that. You're, that's absolutely happening. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I'll come back. To, I'll get to that. Um, so then the question is: So the people I work with, I'll make an observation that I make a little bit of a few later. Probably, I work with people who treat COVID patients. The wards are full of people who have risks factors that make them aspirate nasal fluids while they're sleeping. This is not a trivial comment. This is a critical comment. People in COVID wards tend to aspirate nasal fluids. If you've got a nasal infection with a million infectious virions and a milliliter, and you're aspirating those into your lung at night, I'll talk more about what the consequences are. But now we ask, so they were, they were imagining that these people were inhaling entire boluses all the way that would drain all the way into the deep lungs. So we were compelled to do the following calculation. Let's say you aspirate a one mil bolus with a million infectious variants. That's what a nasal title will tell you. Okay. Or you inhale an aerosol that goes all the way to the deep lung. Take your pick. If you inhale an aerosol, anything sub-micron in diameter that's got an infectious virion, it with high probability will go all the way to the lung. It's it's inertialess. It just travels with the airstream all the way to the deep lung. So here's the calculation. By the way, the alveolar surface area is a tennis court. We got to do oxygen exchange. There's a lot of surface area down there to do oxygen. So what percentage of that is being infected by a one mil bolus with a million infectious variants that lands intact versus one aerosol with one infectious variant? Answer, somewhere up here, one thousandth of a square meter from a bolus with a million infectious variants. So notice you'll need a thousand of them to infect one square meter out of 140 square meters. A thousand of them is a liter. It's a lot of fluid to be sucking into your lungs, right? So that, in my view, that's highly unlikely that you're literally in aspirating entire boluses, and I'll tell you in a second why. And then if it's an aerosol with one infectious virion, then it is one millionth of a square meter in two days. Negligible. Bottom line, you need a lot of them to get a measurable infection of the deep lung. And so you need on the order of a thousand boluses or a whole liter or a million or more aerosols into the deep lung just to infect 1% of the surface area. And here's the calculation. And this is, we did it all at time zero, and then we said, well, that doesn't really happen. What's the phase like if I do it continuously over seven days? So this is 10, 10 to the sixth virions all at time zero, landing in the, in the alveolar space after one, two, three, up to 10 days versus the number of infectious seeds. So anyway, you can do the calculation. What you learn is that you need a million more aerosols or a thousand more boluses that are about available in order to infect 1% of the deep lung. So just back up and process that information. All the action that's leading to alveolar pneumonia is happening in the deep lung 
and then infections are easily happening in the nasal cavity. Nothing in between is transporting it as well. At least not directly. I'll come back to Sharon's question. But in between is not where the action is happening. When you, when you do autopsies on COVID patients, extremely patchy. There's no continuous infection all the way to the deep lung. It's very patchy. And what's happening in the nose versus the deep lung are really almost independent. Okay, so one bottom line is how in the world are you inhaling a million aerosols from somebody else? Highly unlikely. You'd have to sit for a long time to bypass never having a nasal infection. But if you have a high tide of nasal infection, you're, you could very well be aspirating boluses. And if you do the calculation, a one and a half mil bolus must divide by generation two, a one mil bolus must divide by generation three in order to keep going. And then it just divides 15, 17 times, basically effectively aerosolizing that bolus. Okay? So people who aspirate boluses are, unfortunately for them, and this has nothing to do with just SARS CoV 2. This is any nasal infection that then turns into some type of alveolar stress and pneumonia. And to Sharon's point, there I'll talk to you about the people that have been talking about these modes of transmission. Well, if you're polluting the air around you in a stagnant environment where a submicron aerosol will stay in suspended for hours, it's not going anywhere. Okay, so if you're infecting someone else by, and I'll tell you how you're doing, you're not doing it by breathing. It's very unlikely that you're shedding aerosol by breathing. Um, you're inhaling ammonia more than anybody else is inhaling ammonia. You're exhaling aerosols. So um, that's very fully understood appreciated is the fact that if you get a nasal infection, you could very well be polluting your own deep lung more than you're getting a nasal infection to somebody else, or equally as probable, if not far more probable. Okay, um, now, I hope that's sufficient for you. I mean, I'm giving you the sense of, we can reproduce what people are saying. Of what's being observed clinically. Yeah. So the mucus, the volume of mucus production, is that somehow factored in? Is it part of the effect You are swallowing about a liter of mucus a day. So it's constantly, that's why I keep telling people to drink up. Um, you're constantly reproducing mucus. We have we have so many postal glands whose job it is to manufacture mucins and they get shed just into the PCL and then go up into the. So you're constantly replenishing the barrier that's being continuously transported. I don't know if that's what the question you were asking. I'm saying that it stays in a fairly long thickness range. What? Can you assume that the mucus layer stays at a relative stable? It's very stable. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazingly stable. It can't get too far out of the racker to clog the airway, right? And it can't get too thin um, because then you're not protecting the epithelium. So it's there's this homeostasis that sets up and is sustained. Um, okay, so now we were exposed to variants. And so we have this, this computational model here that we can say, well, how in the heck did Delta create three orders of magnitude higher nasal titers from swamp? That's a phenomenal outcome, right? Literally a thousand times higher nasal infection. 
How could that be? I mean, we have the, the, the kinetics here, we have all the mechanics going. So what could possibly explain it? What I showed you before is nothing compared to what happens with Delta. And so the three things that were, and by the way, I'm, I've mentioned here somewhere, but I follow um, Betty Cooper at Los Alamos. Um, her group has been getting the, the, all of the, the SARS-CoV-2 variants and the mutants from the beginning. And they are showing exactly where the mutations are happening. Mostly on the spike domains, but not only on the spike domains. More, more recently. And so what could possibly be happening with the variants? Well, they could be binding differently. And indeed, the, the locations that are, that are binding to the ACE2 receptors have been mutated. And I have a little comment here that I was really thrilled with this because if indeed the mutants, the prominent mutation was that their binding affinity was changing, you can show that the binding affinity I, I used before, 50% likelihood to a, to a ciliated cell in the upper and lower respiratory tract. If it got weaker, then it would actually create more infection. The reason is that it encounters and if it infects with a high probability, it's kind of retarded the progression of spread. Every time it hits one with, with probably 0.5 of the effects, if it got weaker, it would spread faster. Okay. Well, that turned out to be wrong. They did the experiments and in fact it was a strong, a slightly stronger binding affinity, which depressed me for a couple of days. Because if it was getting weaker, it would mutate itself out of business. But that's not happening. So the only other two things, at least that we understand in our, in our mechanical models of things, are it could have been hijacking the cellular machinery faster, or it could have been replicating more efficiently. What else is there? I mean, it could be something else, but I don't know what it is. So we test those, and it turns out. The only way you're going to get the three order magnitude higher viral load is to shorten the test space 50%. And there's evidence that that is happening. That the mutations are allowing the, the virus to hijack the machine in the test. And nothing else can give you three orders of magnitude change. But that's in our model. And I don't know what else we can put in the model from the mutation. Quite honestly. So the other effects, doubling the efficiency of replication, so 4,000 is multiplicative. It's not giving you orders of magnitude differences. And these are for averages over 10 realizations. This is worked by my student who's just been working with me for a couple of months, Jason. Um, these are only 10, so I told him. Go make sure that this is not statistical outliers. Okay. And so he just did the calculations. He did actually a thousand as well as a hundred. These simulations actually consume a lot of data. So it seems trivial to put the answers up, but it's, it's a it takes days on supercomputers and storing the data. And people tell us we're using too much space. Um, and it's it's robust. The prediction there is robust. You just do more, you can do a thousand, you'll get very same answers. Okay, so now we got vaccinated. Or you got infected and you generated antibodies. Or you took my colleague Sam Lives monoclonal antibodies. He's gonna be filthy rich. I've got him committing to my retirement program. Um, he's, he's got a company that makes amazing monoclonal antibodies, and I'll tell you why. Um, we've been studying this for 10 years. 
So this was an easy adaptation on top of our baseline because we've been studying what happens when you ten more minutes. Not bad. I guess when I'm around friends, I don't delay too much. Um, so we superimpose on top of everything I showed you. Now we add antibodies wherever they came from. And I was telling Mansour, I believe, is that if you look in the literature, everybody's talking about neutralization, which means the antibodies come and they cover all the spikes. That's what neutralization is. Um, it's a weak form of protection. So that when the, when the virus encounters an epithelial cell, there's no receptors to bind to the ACE2 receptors on the, on the infected cells. And then there's another one that flags for phagocytes. But more powerful, which is what I've been working on with Sam, is what we discovered way back in the HIV trials. The more powerful antibody protection is not just to cover spikes, but that antibodies have a weak affinity to domains on the weakness. And so if you get enough antibodies that are both bound to the spikes on the viruses and a fraction of them are bound to the mucin polymers, then you immobilize the virus. And that turns out, as I'll show you, to be what must be happening with antibodies we're generating by vaccine. So let me just show you the calculation. Well, here's, I just said what we do. We, we model, and you can ask the question, how long, um, Given the antibody titer, given the binding affinities to spike domains, they're all transient, by the way, and there are there are like 100 timers, 100 spikes on a SARS-CoV-2 virus, so there's three domains to bind to. Given all the kinetics, how fast is it approach to equilibrium number of bound antibodies on the spike? You can do the calculation 10 minutes longer than, than it needs to be, as I'll show you in a second. And then, if in fact a fraction of them are also bound to mucin domains, then, um, then that's going to be a mucotrapping effect of those antibodies. And that's a way weaker condition. Because to track, you only need small numbers. That are bound to spikes and co bound to the mucin polymers. And the question is how fast do these work when you get exposed? And there's the answer neutralization doesn't have a chance. And this was, a, I, I confess, I picked an antibody concentration. And, and what people are not telling you, and I, don't, I can't find in the literature. What it really matters what the antibody titers are in the nasal passages when you get exposed. If, if you know, I, I put one, did one here that's consistent with what we're told. And when you do the calculations, an antibody is binding about every 12 seconds per virion. And then it accumulates, but that turns out not to be fast enough. So you do the calculation, and it's a really a negligible knockdown in infectability by neutralization. So all that talk in the literature about neutralizing antibodies is, I claim, I don't know this for a fact, it's nonsense. Those antibodies also have an affinity to mucin domains, and that effect is dramatic. And it's a much weaker condition to protect you, by the way, right? You don't need to cover almost all the epitopes. You need to cover enough that also co binds to the mucus. The virus is trapped and therefore just flows with the mucus escalator. And there's the calculations. We can get incredible protection from a very low antibody titer of one meg per mil. Okay, I'm almost done. Just a couple things about what other 
people are doing. We're obviously working and bring more people into the group who like to compute. I think um, a couple of things is that it's well known, by the way, that by this guy Gerhard Schuch in Germany, that your last last three small bronchioles before the alveolar space close and open with every breath. That closing and opening is sufficient to rupture aerosols that then travel with your exhaled breath all the way up to the nose and out into the, into the ambient air. So people are, with a deep lung infection, they are absolutely dangerous, not because of their high titanation infection, because those actors clear up really fast because of interferons. So people in the in the COVID wards don't have nasal infections once they get so sick. But they are absolutely exhaling infectious aerosols into the air around them. Um, and then the work I you must have heard, may have heard about Lydia Bariba and Howard Stone. This is what I was mentioning earlier. The, the Reynolds number of exhaled and inhaled air is simply not high enough to rupture complex fluids like nasal fluids and mucus. It's maybe at most 2,000. It sounds high, but it's not. However, when I speak, sing, eat, anything I do that closes and opens wet membranes is rupturing aerosol. So the person speaking in the audience should definitely be wearing a mask way more than you should if you're sitting there going up. And especially if I'm screaming, like I'm thinking about swimming, do I really want to go to a basketball game with a bunch of people screaming? Not so much. Anyway, they're, they've done a lot of cool work and Lydia has been talking about this stuff for quite some time and Howard Stone has done it for the last several months. And they too talk about transmission. And my point is that you do it to yourself, <laughs> right? You're breathing your own exhaled aerosols more than anybody else is all the time. Um, so anyway. And then I just wanted to mention in closing that um, both the NSF and then the, the IMAG MSG working groups have started a lot of people talking to one another who have complementary skills. And um, these groups are going on. And, and Reinhard Lavenbacher at Florida and James Blazer of Indiana, many of you know Fred Adler, other people have been meeting weekly for well over a year now. Um, just sharing skills and what each other's doing and trying to build cooperative capabilities for the next pandemic. Okay. Questions, comments? Say that again. Just because you can't help questions because there's a lot of right. I'm, so anyway, my hearing is so bad, even though I'm going to hear you. Sure. Yeah. So, so Take your mask off. Oh. Oh, if anyone in the virtual audience would like to ask a question, I've, I've been told I can hear you. I have a question in the room. Please. So early on in COVID, there was a very scary CT scan in London. So the pattern of that, and that being the people that you were talking about, earlier in the talk I may have left them. Listen. Repeat it again. Early on in COVID, there was a very scary CT 
I mean, we show that. Yes, Monsieur said that early on there were CT scans showing incredible lung damage um, from exposure. And that lung damage could have been anywhere in the upper respiratory tract. One of the problems is you don't get to see what's going on anywhere below where you can explore, which is very high up. Okay. And what we show is absolutely that if you, when you inhale, you, if you inhale an aerosol, it's going to land, could land, could get obstructed by the hairs in your nose and then go to some, it's all the way to the deep lung and could have, could have collided with the mucus barrier. Higher droplets, bigger than a micron or inertial, and they're likely to land somewhere else. So if someone's sneezing, coughing, singing projectiles that are larger before they evaporate, you could very easily deposit infectious aerosols to droplets anywhere, and they're going to take off. That's what we show. The ciliated cells are 50% or so in the nasal region and only get larger percentage surface area as you go down. So and, and they're highly infectable, high densities of ACE2 receptors to those spikes. So anywhere you get an aerosol depositing, it's not, can't go anywhere faster than it's gonna, gonna encounter an infect. So what, then what happens is, um, especially for COVID-19, people have passed away and we do, or not we, but my colleagues do autopsies, what you can't undo is the healing that's taking place. So you're only seeing what, what the infection looked like when the person passed away. But a lot of stuff has happened. Like I said, the, the interferons are already removing the infections in the, in the nasal passage for people that are in the hospital. Um, so there's a lot of un, you know, unraveling history there. But this, but what I do know from Rick Rochet and all the folks in the Marshall Lung Institute who do autopsies on an hour dozen is that yes, there's lung damage. They only get to see people who succumb, but it's extremely patchy. And it's patchy both because depositions are probably patchy, and then healing is undoing a lot of what damage that was there. But it's not a massive infection, continuous infection. Yes. I and you mentioned that some of these mutations take uh right time and story. And are those people who doctors and what medical uh, is there any type of I don't know information they may struggle with or need like real time? Uh, if somebody is sick, is anything of or is it just the statistical statistics of what's going on and how it is spread or how can be translated to real time by like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, once again, my hearing is compromised, but I think what you're asking is, can they tell how things are progressing? And the answer is, the big problem is, how do you probe someone's respiratory tract? It's dangerous to do that. You have to already be, have a clinical reason to stick something down someone's throat and into their lung and go deep into the lung and look at it. So that's a problem. And that's one of the reasons why you have to have modeling because you literally cannot probe it, right? And so you, you have to have some kind of guidance for people, my clinical colleagues and medical colleagues to say, well, what's possible? Like, like for example, they told me 
in the cell paper 2020, highly cited paper, paper by Ralph Barrett and Rick Boucher as the lead PIs on the paper. They thought people were aspirating full one mil, one and a half mil bowls as all the way they want. And my response to them was, well, here's a calculation. You got to do a thousand of them. And they still think that it could possibly happen. And my response is, yeah, but you, okay. The, the, it's true that the lung has the capability to absorb some of that fluid. But a one liter aspiration is pretty extreme. And so, you know, we, I tell them it's almost surely the case that that bowl is worth dividing a bunch of times. Because you need way too much volume of in boluses to infect even 1% of the people. But anyway, it's a real problem that you can't go and get the data that you'd like to get until someone's passed away. And then they autopsy their lungs and, and are amazed at how patchy it is, how, how it's not a continuous infection. Um, so I know that it's rare, but what is the Well, well, you know, one of the things I didn't dwell on a whole lot was when we do these calculations, say this one or this one, um, and these are in the nasal passages. What I don't have, have not shown you here is, you tell me what titer of antibiotics you have. That's critical. And where are the titers sufficient? Because so there's going to be a tipping point. You don't have enough antibodies. You can't neutralize fast enough. And if they do co-bind, which by the way, all the monoclonal antibodies can combine co bind to mucus as well. Um, there's got to be enough of them given the, the, the viral titers. So you, you get exposed, and what you want to do is arrest the infection in the first place, right? And so um, if you've got a, a breakthrough infection, my guess is that the antibody titer, titer was not high enough. And that's what's happening with people like me who, who got vaccinated very early on because I'm old. Um, and then my antibody titers are diminishing all the time, so now I'm old. So you better get boosted. I, I, I had to get boosted. And I did this. I lied to get boosted fast. Or I found a you know rogue pharmacist who would give me a, a boost fast, <laughs> literally. Um, but so it's all about what's the antibody title. And you, they're not reporting that. You tell me, show me what's the antibody title for Moderna, Pfizer. It's not just so when they say you're, you're, they report things like um, infectability, right? Breakthrough infections. Well, how's it happen? Is it happening because the antibody titer was low? Almost sure. Okay. So if that's waning, then you're going to drop below the ability to arrest it and clear it before, before you get infected. And that's what's happening with breakthrough infections. So very likely it. it perceive the same as if you didn't have antibodies if the virus is too low at that time. Say that again? Oh, if your antibody concentration is too low, then the virus will progress as if there were none. Like you would expect uh, it to be not, I mean, there'll be a diminished effect, but it, but it will still take off, right? Yeah. So we could knock this down. Like we could say, and right now I think probably the effect per counter per second was 0.5. Well, if there's antibodies that are that are covering, I'm gonna knock it down. Okay. So it's easy to sort of force grain that effect. Effectively, you're probably gonna infect for a time of the second as well. 
Um, but there's a you can just do the calculation if you if you tell me what the antibody titer is, and we could do that calculation, we haven't done it. Um, you get a certain exposure, hit it, nose, trachea, generation three, generation five. You get a certain exposure somewhere in that track. How many virions are there? And then how many, what's the antibody concentration? Number of antibodies per unit body. That will affect the encounters of virions and antibodies. Their binding affinities will affect how fast they accumulate to some equilibrium number. If they don't also co-bind to mucus, then we can show that's going to be too slow to protect you. If they do bind to mucus, we can show up a lot of down and you'll be protected. So, you know, these things are easy calculation, but what, what I rarely find out there is from different vaccines, do they have co-binding affinity to both spikes and, and what, by the way, what are they? A number um, that I can tell you then how fast they're going to accumulate on the spikes and with what saturation level, and do they also bind to mucin domain? Those are critical factors that are you really can't find it anywhere in the world. No one's reporting that. Okay. Uh, in addition to uh, direct antibody count as like you know as a measure of protection, there are other uh, protection mechanisms like T cell immunity, right? So have you comment on this? Yeah, we are just superimposing that. So I don't have answers to this. But we know, and I listed early on, there are multiple macrophages, T cells, T cells can make um, antibodies. All of those are going to be interferons produced by infected cells. All of that's compatible with the baseline model we have now. But we just don't have any results yet. And again, it's going to have a lot to do with how many of them are there. Um, so, your protection in the alveolar domain, macrophages, and T cells, right? Um, how many of them are there, which will control what the encounters are going to be? And in the alveolar space, the thickness is so low, it's not moving at all, it's too crude nanometers. So that's why once you are down in the alveolar space, even though alveolar type T cells are only making up 20% of the surface area and there, they have way less density of receptors, the alveolar fluid is so thin, it's twice the size of the virion. They're constantly encountering the boom, you know, the fusing encounter, the fusing encounter. So even though the probability to to bind is lower, they're constantly encountering. And so, you know, but then what we do right now, and, and you know, the first course frame way to deal with macrophages and T cells is to simply put a half life on virions and, and infected cells. You, you could you could course range it. You could right now we say, oh, the virions live in, in, you know, until they get cleared or they infect. Well, if there's macrophages eating them up, depending on the concentration, we know what encounters are going to be. We put a half life on them, so it's easy to model that, right? I mean, again, I, you know, I can tell you because you're all familiar with this. This is not hard math. You got to know enough about the physiology and the anatomy, and then how to do, you know, the geometry is what's mattering, right? All the details really matter. And I gave a lecture at UC Irvine at the symposium. The guy said, why, why are you doing all this work? Why don't you force brain? I said, you tell me how. You tell me how all this doesn't matter. 
when we're done, I can probably force frame something, but it seems to me that you've got to first do the detailed kinetics of everything. And then you can start talking about how to make things go faster and not be so detailed. Any more questions? I think it's fixed.